good morning dear students recently we have finished uh, the examination of a swelling and uh, you might have heard about the examination of a breast swelling today we will uh, start thyroid so the session will be like this first i will brief you about the history and uh, the examination in a systematic manner then we will also see the video just like the other day so please do concentrate on this because this is an important uh, case you will be definitely getting at least uh, one in three four candidates will be getting thyroid uh, swelling in the examination so first let us start the theory so examination of a thyroid swelling so already we have finished the history of a swelling so it is easy now so but the three salient points of history or uh, the age the sex and residence so can you tell me the importance of age as far as uh, thyroid swellings are concerned importance of age in thyroid swellings yes yeah this is so you have fallen into my trap so malignancy is in older age that's what you have written so let us uh, start from uh, the younger ages so the young people particularly children they will be having this uh, this hormonogenesis so the, by this we mean that uh, there is some deficiency of an enzyme there is a syndrome called as pendred syndrome So, what is this pendred syndrome? Can you tell me, anybody? Because uh, this has a relation with the subjects which you have passed recently. Pendred syndrome. Yes. Congenital sensorineural hearing loss and goiter. Good. What is the enzyme that is uh, efficient in these individuals? What enzyme? Any enzyme is there that uh, is uh, having its influence on the thyroid? Yeah. Iodinase. Something similar but not iodinase. Some other? Some other A's only. Yes. So it is uh, peroxidase. So peroxidase hormone now uh, enzyme is uh, deficient in these people. Incidentally, there is a deficiency of uh, the. Uh, there is sensory neural uh, efficiency also so that uh, in children that is the problem then uh, as they grow particularly girls in uh, menstrual uh, that is uh, premenstrual menstrual age so there is what whiter 
this. What guiter will be there in uh, those uh, uh, they are in a pivotal age? Liberty is a physiological uh, event, isn't it? So, what goiter they will get? Because of the increasing demand of iodine, so they will be getting yeah. so they will be getting a colloid. Colloid is uh, second stage. Is so hyperplastic. Yeah, to some extent you are correct, hyperplastic, but uh, we don't call like that. We call it as physiological void. So physiological goiter, yeah, so physiological goiter, now the, that age that is the one, then uh, as the age increases between 20 to 40, the regular uh, this uh, colloid goiter, multinodular goiter, all those goiters are common in uh, 20 to 40 years. But here I want to tell you that uh, malignancy also, the age is not very old age, it is uh, not even middle age because it may be seen in uh, any age between uh, 20 to 50, 60, like that. So we cannot pinpoint one particular age and contrary to other malignancies, thyroid malignancies may not appear at old age, even younger ages they may be seen. So that point you have to keep in mind. Whereas old age, what malignancy is common among thyroid malignancies? Suppose in a 60 year old female, if you see malignancy of thyroid, what type you have to immediately think of rather? Papillary anaplastic, good. So it is the anaplastic carcinoma which you have to think of. Whenever there is a malignancy developing in old age of uh, any female patient, right? So, this is the importance of age, then the sex. Of course, you all know that uh, thyroid, thyroid diseases are common in females, maybe some uh, 10 times commoner, but in a male patient, if there is thyroid, you have to suspect malignancy. That is another point which you have to bear in mind. So it is not very common benign diseases in uh, uh, males. So whenever you see a thyroid swelling in a male, first you exclude uh, malignancy. May not be malignant, common is still benign, but the frequency with which malignancy occurs in males is more than females. Because all the diseases are common in females, uh, you will be not uh, missing malignancy because you will be thinking of all those conditions. Whereas in males, if you only think of benign conditions, then you may be missing malignancy. That is very important. Then residents, of course, all of you know that uh, those are living in uh, hilly regions. So in our district, uh, Arku, Paderu, all those areas and in uh, India, all hilly regions and Himalayas, there will be endemic goiter, right? So that is the 
importance of patient particulars as far as thyroid is concerned rest is all routine like any other swelling now coming to chief complaint most of the patients will be complaining of uh, swelling in the neck in front of the neck that is the commonest symptom swelling in front of the neck then some patients may also have difficulty in swallowing so it is not dysphagia most of you will be telling dysphagia dysphagia is uh, more sinister problems particularly carcinoma esophagus the other day i was telling you about uh, dysphagia and thyroid swelling uh, don't jump to conclusion that uh, the dysphagia is due to thyroid swelling it may be carcinoma esophagus particularly in a old individual right so swelling difficulty in swallowing then pain pain is not a routine symptom in uh, thyroid diseases but still there may be pain particularly in uh, inflammatory conditions like uh, thyroiditis right then even in uh, benign conditions like multinodular goiter if it is used the patient may have pressure over the nerves thereby producing the pain but that is very not very common the other situation where there may be pain is in malignancies where the nerves are involved so once again pain means you have to think of either uh, thyroiditis or malignancies then the next important symptom is hoarseness of voice so once there is a patient himself is complaining he herself is complaining or you on asking they have volunteered that there is or by the talk of the patient itself you have recognized that the patient is having hoarseness then you have to think of again two conditions that is one is very rarely multinodal goiter becoming uh, very used and then uh, compressing the recurrent laryngeal nerve whereas malignancy it is one of the symptoms of malignancy so whenever there is hoarseness think of malignancy that is very important then bulging of eyes this is in the language of uh, patient i have written so what do we call this bulging of eyes yes so x of talmas good so it is x of talmas so many have volunteered to tell nice so but uh, you have to write in patients words only in history so bulging of eyes the patient may complain so once again the chief complaints will be swelling difficulty in swallowing pain rarely hoarseness is very significant and whenever there is toxicity there may be bulging of eyes so in thyroid again i would like you to ask in a set pattern so as the patient is mainly complaining of swelling you have to ask the present history in five different headings so what are those five different headings i'll be telling you so first thing is the swelling so this is the commonest symptom so that is the first heading so you have to ask everything about uh, swelling so you have to ask everything about swelling then related symptoms that means other symptoms of thyroid like dysphagia hoarseness pain right symptoms of toxicity all those things so 
then another important pressure symptoms so pressure symptoms means there may be difficulty in uh, breathing all those things difficulty in uh, voice so all these things will come as uh, pressure symptoms then you have to ask about toxic symptoms. We will discuss individually. Then finally, metastatic symptoms for carcinoma of the thyroid. So, swelling is first, then related symptoms, any other swellings in the neck, something like that. Then pressure symptoms like uh, difficulty in swallowing, breathing, and hoarseness of voice. Toxic symptoms, metastatic symptoms. So we will go one by one. So first, let us talk about the swelling. So what are all the things we have to talk about uh, the swelling? First thing is the site of the swelling. So. Naturally, the patient will be telling you that it is in front of the neck and which part of the neck. So usually thyroid swelling is in the lower part of the neck. That is very important. Then size is important because sometimes there may be what is called as a solitary nodule of thyroid. So solitary nodule will be on one side and it is smaller in size compared to a diffuse thyroid swelling that is seen in either in a physiological goiter or a multinodular goiter or for that matter even carcinoma. So size is important to estimate the, to, to guess the disease. Then duration is also important here again I want to stress you that the duration for malignancies in thyroid need not be short. Usually, let us say for carcinoma breast or for any sarcoma, it may be three to six months. Whereas in thyroid, it is not like that. It may be for years. So there may be, may not be a de novo malignancy. First, there may be a multinodular goiter and some part of it may turn into malignancy or it may start as a de novo malignancy but even de novo malignancy also the duration of thyroid malignancy is, is long compared to other malignancies so just because there is the duration is in years don't exclude carcinoma thyroid that is important then again mode of onset also again uh, Mode of onset is not abrupt in, carc in carcinoma thyroid. That is one thing. It may be insidious even in carcinoma. So mode of onset except in uh, inflammations like thyroiditis. The mode of onset is insidious, slowly progressing. So these two are important. These three are important. Duration, mode of onset, progression, all these three are very slow in uh, malignancies of thyroid. So just by long duration or insidious onset of uh, the disease or slow progression, don't exclude malignancies in thyroid. That is very important. So gradually increasing the swelling. So, can you tell me other organ where uh, in the head and neck only the other organ that is having a slow progression even in malignancy, just like thyroid? So, the just by duration or mode of onset or progression, we cannot exclude uh, malignancies in another organ of uh, the head and neck only. Acoustic neuronoma, no, no, no. Uh, mucoepidermide, good. Salivary gland, particularly parotid gland, good. So, uh, the carcinoma parotid, 
may be long standing so that is another thing you have to remember so both thyroid and parotid it may be long duration even in uh, years so then pain already i told you pain may be there in uh, inflammations and malignancies so next is pressure symptoms so difficulty in swallowing difficulty in breathing hoarseness of voice right then why have put here any other swellings please tell me why i have asked to talk about any other swelling yes in relation to thyroid why should we ask any other swellings so let's don't write short forms yeah you are correct metastasis good metastasis in metastasis where so thyroid has got two important varieties of carcinoma as you know so one will spread to one part another will spread to another part so swellings there you have to ask lungs lungs will be swellings will be there in lungs and maybe yeah lymph nodes which lymph node it should be very specific lymph node you have retain cervical lymph so any other swelling means cervical lymph nodes then also there is another thing that is bony swellings because there is one malignancy of thyroid which will spread by blood stream what is that which malignancy of thyroid will spread by bone by hematogenous root follicular good so you have to think of swellings both in the neck that is lymph nodes and bony okay so these two things you have to think of whenever uh, you talk about uh, any other swelling right so then you have to ask about uh, suppose you think it is a benign condition then you have to exclude uh, other diseases like uh, you have to ask about uh, chest symptoms abdominal symptoms because this thyroid may be an incidental finding which has brought the patient but his problem may be something entirely different so you have to ask about other systemic symptoms like abdominal and chest symptoms whereas if you suspect or if uh, for every case of thyroid you have to ask about toxic symptoms then metastatic symptoms of course as somebody has pointed out metastasis to the lungs so you have to ask about cough dyspnea hemoptysis like that whereas we will concentrate today on toxic symptoms so what are all the toxic symptoms so here it is very convenient for us to divide into various systems so here first the preference is to cns because in primary aerotoxicosis cns symptoms will prevail whereas in secondary it will be cvs in both there may be gat symptoms so some other systems are also there but we will concentrate today on cns first so the most prominent symptom of toxicity is preference to cold that is very very important of course our rather today is uh, all of us uh, though we are all youth i right uh, we prefer to sit in uh, a cold uh, room isn't it so but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we are all toxic eh? so but generally the patient will be preferring cold weather that is the important symptom of toxicity then the patient may not complain of bulging eyes the 
relatives or attendants of the patient will complain that the patient of that is developing bulging eyes. That is another important symptom. But uh, without this symptom, if you say that I will not diagnose is wrong. So this is seen in late cases only. So don't uh, uh, don't exclude toxicity if there is no X of then staring look. So what is the staring look? I'll show you. So, so that is the staring look. Okay. So the patient or attendants may complain that uh, she's having or on your own you will observe that patient is having staring look. Right. Then irritability. Patient uh, again this is a symptom given by Relatives or attendants, patient is irritable, okay, or anxious, okay. Then another important symptom is insomnia. So there used to be one uh, veins index. Now we are not uh, stressing on it, but uh, for each of these symptoms, we used to give points, like preference to hold two points. Whereas for insomnia, it is three points because that is the very characteristic symptom of uh, thyrotoxicosis, insomnia. Then sweating, excessive sweating. Uh, of course, again, this is also weather based. So, but still, if uh, even in uh, winter, if there is sweating, that means the patient is suffering from toxicity. Then patient herself may complain of tremors or you may observe tremors. So these are the symptoms of central nervous system. Of course, there are two other symptoms which you, I have put in GAT, but in reality they are uh, of uh, CNS, that is increased appetite and uh, loss of weight. So loss of weight despite increased appetite, these two symptoms are very prominently seen in uh, toxicity, right? So these are the symptoms. Once again, cold preference, bulging eyes, staring look, irritability, insomnia, sweating, tremor, loss of weight despite increased appetite. So these are the symptoms. Then let us go to send uh, cardiovascular system that is palpitation is very common both in primary and secondary toxicity. Then the patient may also complain of dyspnea, chest pain, and if there is congestive heart failure, particularly in secondary toxicity, there may be edema of the feet. So these are the symptoms of cardiovascular system. So then GAT, the patient may also complain of diarrhea. Okay, so these are the symptoms of uh, toxicity. Then you have to go for past history. For any surgical disease, uh, you have to talk about uh, these three only. In past history, don't talk about medical history because that is in medicine, in surgery, we don't talk about uh, medical history, except in uh, personal history, some or treatment history. So in surgical case history, you have to talk about if the patient has come with a swelling, you have to say, ask whether there is any similar swelling previously, because the disease may be recurrent. So a thyroiditis, for example, may be recurrent. A physiological goiter previously treated and subsided, again it can recur if there is again period of stress like pregnancy and lactation. So there may be a history that there is a similar swelling previously. Then history of surgery again. So this is again, suppose the patient might have had a, a right solitary nodule it was operated, that is, the surgery for the solitary nodule we do is hemithyroidectomy. 
we will remove only that half of the thyroid. So the patient may have now left side thyroid swelling because left lobe is still preserved. So history of surgery is very important in a thyroid case. Then tuberculosis also because not uh, to exclude tuberculous thyroiditis, which is very rare. The swelling in question may be tuberculous lymph node. So you may be confusing it with thyroid. So that's why these three histories are important in past history. Of course, personal history as far as the thyroid is concerned, you have to talk about diet. So what sort of salt the patient is using? So is it iodinated or not? That is very important. Previously, we used to ask rock salt or table salt. Now, even rock salt is iodinated. So you have to ask specifically whether it is iodinated salt they are using or not. So in addition to salt, you have to ask about the intake of goitrogens. Goitrogens may be food or drugs. So food, of course, all of you know about the cabbage family, brassica family, all these uh, particularly leafy vegetables. They may be deficient in uh, iodine. Whereas, can you tell me some drugs which can produce uh, goiter? Any drug previously used, no, not routinely used. Levothyroxine will produce a goiter. Why? Sulfonyl urea. Lithium. Yeah. These are some of the drugs. Amiodarone, yes. So these are all the drugs. Lithimazole. Lithimazole is an antithyroid drug. So here, you have to again uh, know that uh, the antithyroid drugs, if they are given excessively, then what will happen is there may be again, uh, because of excessive uh, inhibition of thyroid hormone production, there may be quite, you are correct. So, Previously, we used to use for tuberculosis PAS, that is uh, paramino salicylic acid. So these drugs can produce, yes, goiters. So we have to ask about that is three. Then, because it is mainly females that suffer with thyroid diseases, it is compulsory that we should ask about menstrual. So menstrual history usually the toxicity will produce what the menstrual disturbance? Toxicity will produce what the menstrual disturbance? The amenorrhea, good? Yes. So toxicity may produce uh, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. So menstrual history is very important as far as uh, thyroid is concerned. Then, regarding family history also, you have to ask whether uh, the patients are uh, living in endemic area because those who live in endemic areas, the entire family may be suffering with uh, uh, hypothyroid uh, disorders. Already we talked about enzyme deficiency, that is peroxidase deficiency can lead to pendrets. There may be family history of malignancies, particularly thyroid malignancies. And uh, in past history, of course, I didn't tell you, but uh, completion sake, previous history of uh, radiation is very important. Because uh, radiation can also 
after exposure to 10 15 years now the chernobyl and uh, in japan hiroshima those uh, variations are now resulting in thyroid disorders so past history of uh, radiation is also important right so so far i think uh, we will uh, what is the time Till next time, so we'll finish off uh, physical examination. So I'm going a bit slow because this is very, very important, and uh, definitely, as I told you, at least uh, 30 to 35 per people will get this uh, case as a long case, and it is 50 months. So please be careful and listen carefully. So physical examination, of course, general survey. We have to concentrate on built-in nourishment because uh, hyperthyroidism, the patient is thin built and uh, the, though is, uh, he, she is uh, taking food, she is, uh, appears like ill-nourished, but uh, thin built. So that is very important, whereas the contra is true as far as uh, myxedema is concerned because the patient will be heavy built and uh, so they will be appearing very fatty, right? Now faces already I have shown you, the staring look. So whereas uh, hypothyroid or myxedema patient will be having a very lazy look okay then pulse rate very very important so you have to exclude uh, thyrotoxicosis if the pulse is more than 90 or 100 so these three points are very important as far as general survey is concerned of course local examination all of you know inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation are having very limited role but for completion sake you can do it but we will concentrate today on uh, inspection. So how to inspect thyroid of course you have to sit in front of the patient and then uh, examine the neck whereas uh, in uh, whom you adopt this Pigillos method. What is this Pigillos method? And uh, in whom will you adopt this method? So what is this Pigillos method and in whom you will adopt this method? I think you might have heard about it. Yeah, short neck, good. Short neck, particularly males, because they are muscular, they may not be showing the thyroid, so you have to adopt this method. So the patient will be extending the neck and then uh, the arms, that is the hands will be put on the back of the neck. I will demonstrate, of course, it is shown in the video. So you can all see that video. So Pizillo's method is one which all of us will adapt. The first thing is the shape of the thyroid. So what is the shape of the thyroid? So here, just let us see the <coughs> video. Thyroid gland is located in front of the neck with its two lobes on either sides of the trachea connected by an isthmus. So that is the shape of the thyroid. Usually it is described as uh, a butterfly shaped uh, swelling. So if, it's, if it is a diffuse swelling, then you have to say a butterfly shaped swelling. Starting itself you have to say a butterfly shaped swelling. Of course, if it is irregular, you can tell irregular. But if it is having that shape, 
butterfly shape you have to say butterfly shape right so shape is important then size is also important already I told you about the size then what is the position what is the extent so what is the position what is the extent so this is the position of thyroid and this is the extent see here the maximum extent will be up to the just below the upper border of the thyroid cartilage just below there is actually a line there from that line to there is some space in the soprasternal notch so this is the exact position of thyroid right size is also you can measure next so extent is also important already I told you here in thyroid the important extent is what what important extent is you have to know as far as thyroid is concerned yes which extent is important yes retrosternal extent very good so retrosternal extent is very important i'll show you the retrosternal extent you see here you are not able to see the lower border of the thyroid so retrosternal extent is very very important actually though there is no such sign now just like uh, getting above in hydrocel our people now call it getting below thyroid it's actually not a sign is but still people ask for it what is this getting below thyroid in this case you cannot get below thyroid right so that is the extent then immediately once you think that it is thyroid because of its shape position then immediately you have to do before all these things the movement with the deglutition of course how can we suppose you go on asking the patient to move, swallow patient will get tired so what is the easy way of asking not asking the patient but uh, by some technique you can make the patient swallow repeatedly what is that technique yes so i'm unable to stop this Uh, nobody is able to tell me the technique how we can make the patient swallow drinking glass of water yes very good so register number 7150 very good so you can ask the patient to drink water a glass of water sip by sip continuously so that you can uh, see the patient swallowing right so just let us see the uh, swallowing part we begin our examination of the thyroid swellings by inspection for inspection make the patient sit on a stool with the neck slightly hyperextended and inspect the thyroid from the front asking the patient to swallow makes the thyroid more prominent for examined and ask the patient
with the right hand note the consistency surface and borders carefully palpate the tray around the neck with the thumbs over the occiput scars and sinuses and dilated veins look for any visible pulsations in the swelling then ask the patient to swallow this sign is diagnostic of a thyroglossal cyst ask the patient to which is not attached to the pretracheal fascia like this lipoma fixed to the thyroid cartilage so when the superior constrictors of larynx pull the thyroid cartilage up during deglutition the thyroid also moves up and down of course we should not forget the other so here you have to know that uh, the other swellings that move with the uh, deglutition or uh, so it is the spelling is please carefully see it is deglutition not deglutition some people say deglutition something like that so the spelling is very very important it is deglutition not deglutition or deglutition right or some people say even deglutination so that is also wrong so it will uh, give you an awkward picture whenever you say deglutination so please see this uh, spelling deglutition so these are the different swellings that move with deglutition one is thyroid of course all of you know thyroglossal cyst pretracheal lymph nodes subhyoid parsa very rare i have seen only one case so don't bother about it of course carcinoma that is visible from outside so these are the three things which you have to remember of the three these two are very important right then of course protrusion of the tongue so for thyroglossal cyst already it was uh, demonstrated there that is uh, the protrusion of tongue the movement with the protrusion of the tongue let us see that so here you will see that the swelling will be moving with the other swellings that also move on deglutition that is the thyroglossal cysts pretracheal lymph nodes subhyoid bursa and extrinsic carcinoma of larynx a swelling which is not attached to the pretracheal fascia like this lipoma will not move upwards during deglutition not the upward movement of the thyroid cartilage but not of the swelling if the swelling is a nodule close to the midline you must also test for its upward movement on protrusion of the tongue ask the patient to extend the neck and open the mouth wide now keeping the mouth open let the patient move the tongue out and in this is a thyroglossal cyst and note the upward movement of the swelling as the tongue is protruded this sign is diagnostic of a thyroglossal cyst which is connected to the foramen cecum of the tongue a thy so movement with protrusion of tongue is important then you have to go for once you confirm that it's a thyroid swelling then you go for surface and borders so usually the surface of a thyroid is either smooth or nodule so you will see the two surfaces here see here this is a smooth surface in a primary toxic void there is multiple nodules you are able to appreciate i believe in uh, so multiple nodules here you are seeing in a multinodular goiter with secondary toxicity right so surface is important it will even diagnose the condition then uh, <coughs> after surface we will uh, go for the borders here again it is very important to note the 
whether the swelling is extending retrosternal leg. So the borders are important. The superior border already told you will be stopping short of the superior border of thyroid cartilage. Whereas laterally on both sides, they will be disappearing under the both sternomastoids. Whereas inferiorly, it will be about one centimeter from the sternal notch, usually. So that is the border. Then skin over the swelling. So we will see this video again so that you can know the skin or the swelling. So don't bother about the talk he is giving you. Just concentrate. Aeroglossal fistula also moves upwards on protrusion of the tongue as the fistula is connected to the foramen cecum. And of course, it also moves up with deglutition. So once again, the size, shape, location of the thyroid, the borders, that is the extent of thyroid. Then the surface, is it smooth or nodular? Don't bother about bosselated surface. Then we will discuss about the skin. Is it is there any redness very rarely seen then uh, so is there any edema scars and sinuses are very important in thyroid so what are these scars and sinuses let us see on inspection Now you see what are the things you have to so these are the things which you have to see redness edema of course this is very rare to find whereas scars of previous surgery so it is very very important that if the patient gives history of previous surgery on the neck particularly thyroid then you have to see this incision. What is the usual incision we give for uh, thyroid? Yes. What is the incision we give for uh, thyroid? Name of incision or shape of incision? Cocker cervical collar. Oh. Entire thing we have given good 7081. So, Cocker's collar incision in the neck. That's what we give. So, it's a semi lunar incision, which all of you must be knowing. So here you can see I have drawn the line below the neck in the lower part of the neck. That is very, very important. So that is the Cocker's incision, right? So now uh, I think, uh, yeah, another five minutes. So previous scar, then sinuses not sinuses, actually we have fistula, that is, what are the two fistulas or one fistula or sinus, can you tell me, fistula and sinus.
what are the fistulas you can see on the neck, fistulas openings. Another one is either, uh, one is fistula of course, another one is either a fistula or a sinus. So once you see that uh, you need not examine the patient, yeah, branchial cyst, first part is correct, branchial not branchial cyst, it is branchial fistula. So this branchial fistula is seen in the so branchial cyst is in the upper one junction of upper one third and lower two thirds. Branchial fistula is in the lower one third. Similarly, thyroglossal cyst that gets infected and then uh, ruptures, then it will be producing thyroglossal sinus. That's what this video shows. So once this is over, we'll stop for today. So just see. Dilated veins are also important, particularly when so. These are the dilated veins is showing. So this is the thyroglossal sinus of previously infected thyroglossal cyst. So, so the veins may be seen. So that's it. Right? So I think for uh, today we will uh, so after skin over these wellings we will look for pulsations. Of course, unless you have a keen eye, you may not appreciate pulsations on inspection. Then, pulsations over the gland, not over the carotid artery. That is also important. Most of us will be telling me carotid artery pulsations. No, it is pulsations over the upper pole of the gland. Then, any other swellings. Any other swelling there means again you have to think of lymph nodes. And finally, the trachea. So trachea, is it in the midline? First of all, is it seen or not? In retrosternal diet, you will not be able to see the trachea. Whereas uh, in uh, other swellings, you may be able to see the trachea, then is it in the midline or deviate? So that is as far as inspection is concerned. And so in the next class, we will talk about the palpation of a thyroid spelling. Right. If you have any doubts, one or two minutes I will spare. So, anybody has any doubts, you can ask me in two minutes time. Signal us. Number us. So the Okay, thank you.